Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, if you are new with us today, I want to say a special welcome to you. My name is Jason Cusick. I'm the lead pastor here at Journey of Faith. And so I'm getting started. An important thing to know about us is we are a, a multi-campus church. So what that means is we're one church in more than one location. So this is the point in the service where our two campuses come together. So we have a a campus at Torrance High School. Hey, everybody, our Torrance campus. We're excited to join via video with our Torrance campus. And then we also have some people watching online. So great that we can be together in this way. We are beginning this series called The Good Life. And doesn't that sound good? We all want to live the good life. And I was thinking about what, is that, what does that mean? What does that stir up in me, that phrase? And my mind immediately shot back to my senior year of high school and I had this idea in my mind that I was going to leave my last day of high school driving away in a new awesome car. And all the students would see me just driving. It would be so, it, it was going to be a great moment. I had this thing built up. It was like a bucket list. This has got to happen. And I got to admit, the idea in my mind was pretty cinematic. The, you know, they would look at the car and kind of go up the back and then they would see me and I'd give this look, you know. It was just going to be this, this great moment, right? So the school year was moving on and I, I didn't know how to get a car. I mean, we didn't have the money for a new car. I had worked all high school at, at moving furniture for a furniture company and so I'd saved a bunch of money. Um, my mom had talked to my uncle who lived in Colorado and he rebuilt cars and he said I could rebuild a car for you and then I could drive it out and then you could buy it off me and you can have a car that way and I was like okay he came through this was great it was all coming together got a car Datsun 200 SX it was awesome uh 250 air conditioning that means you roll down the two windows drive 50 miles per hour that's that's the air conditioning <laughs> um Paid the money for it, got it. It was all coming together. Here's a picture of me with the car back in high school. Yeah! <laughs> oh, it was, it was so great. It was all coming together. Now, last day of school, it was a late start day. So all the students were in school. I show up a little bit late, which is great because nobody sees me pull up in the car, right? So I pull up. There's a spot right out in front of where the school lets out like preordained from God, there was a spot there. And so I pull into that spot. I'm like, this is going to be amazing. So I go into the school. All day I'm waiting for this moment that I've had built up, right? Um, the bell rings. I hustle out and I get out to my car before anybody is out. And I'm like, well, I can't just sit in the car because they have to see me get into it <laughs> so that I can drive away. So I'm kind of like, 10 feet away, just kind of wandering around. And then critical mass of people come out, just the right number come out. So I announce my time. Walk over, open up the car, get inside, sit down, close the door, turn the key, nothing happens. <laughs> I left the lights on all day long, <laughs> killed the battery, and this big cinematic moment ended on an isolated street at 4.30 in the afternoon with a AAA guy under the hood trying to charge this battery. It was awful. But I think I've done this at different times in my life where I build up this moment or this thing or this relationship or this event. And, and sometimes it comes through, but it's, it's never really like what I thought it was going to be. And maybe you've done this too. We build these things up and we think, if, if, if I have this, or if this happens, or if, if, if I have this experience, or I have this feeling, then this will be the good life. You know, then I've, I've, I've made it. We spend a lot of time pursuing this good life, and, and it kind of eludes us. There's, there's some of us here who, even just maybe even this week, applied for that dream job and didn't get it. There's some of us here that got the dream job and now we're in it and we're like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Or you get the family and then you get the diagnosis. 
You know, like we weren't supposed to get sick like this. Or you're in that relationship and you're like, oh, this is the one. And you just broke up. Or there's some of you, and I know there's at least one of you, you've got the looks, you've got the car, the house, the, the fame, the, the money, the education. You got all the pieces in place. But this week, maybe even last night, you sat up while everybody else was asleep and you were like, is this it? We have this hunger inside us for the good life. What is it? How do we get it? And, and what are the barriers to us experiencing it? In this series, we're going to talk about what Jesus says about life. We're going to look at some of the things that Jesus said about life and the life that he offers and maybe some of the barriers to entry into that life. We're going to see what Jesus would say the good life is all about. We're going to talk about great relationships. We're going to talk about having a life of compassion and justice. We're going to talk about how Jesus gives us the ability to deal with change in our lives. We're going to talk about the importance of simplicity and contentment rather than living our lives continually based on trying to get the next thing. And today I want to talk to you about the, the foundation of the good life, and that is by having a relationship with Jesus, the one that's offering a, a good life to us. And, and here's the main idea that we'll kind of flesh out today. By following Jesus, we can have a rich and satisfying life. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at some quotes from Jesus. These quotes are courtesy of a guy named John. John was one of Jesus' closest friends. While Jesus taught, John took notes. And then he compiled them together and he wrote a book that explains some of Jesus' life and teachings. And we have that book. It's in the New Testament. It's called The Gospel According to John. And it's lasted 2,000 years. And it's just as relevant today as it was back then. So we're going to take some excerpts from the 10th chapter of John's book that where he records some of Jesus' teachings. And here's one of the things that Jesus said about living life with him. Take a look at this quote. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus loved using metaphors. He would find things that everybody knew about in his day. And in first century Palestine, there were a lot of sheep and a lot of shepherds. And so he said, well, that's like me. And people in his day, they knew the difference between good shepherds and bad shepherds. Good shepherds cared for their sheep, loved their sheep, protected their sheep. When their sheep got into problems, uh, good shepherds would help them get out of those problems. And, and shepherds would train their sheep to live in a way that would allow them to flourish. And so Jesus says, that's what I am. I'm a good shepherd. I, I love you. I, I want to care for you. I want to protect you. I want to help get you out of danger. I also want to help train you so you can enjoy the flourishing life that I have for you. Now, I'm a South Bay native. How many South Bay natives? People at Torrance, uh, sitting at home online, raise your hand. Uh, uh, so I don't know anything about sheep. <laughs> or shepherds. I know th South Bay things, right? I know traffic. I know earthquakes. I know temperature within a 10 degree range. You know, like that's the stuff I know. So like, what is Jesus? I want to know more about sheep. So I, I went to a, a trusted, weighty, biblical uh, scholarship resource. I went on Wikipedia and I, and I looked up the word sheep. And you know what I learned? Um, I used to think sheep are dumb, but they're not, actually. Did you know that? Sheep are really smart. They're really smart animals. Uh, sheep know their shepherd, and they're very loyal to their shepherd. They know their shepherd's voice. They know how to follow their shepherd. Here's the two problems I found out when I was looking into what sheep, uh, about sheep. One of them is they are herd animals which means they go with the crowd. If a sheep sees all the other sheep going in a certain direction, the sheep assumes that the first one is following the good shepherd. 
So they go, oh, okay, that's fine. The first one might not be following the right person. It might be going in the wrong way, but all the rest follow. So they're herd him. They follow the crowd. Isn't that like us? We tend to follow the crowd. Well, everybody's doing that. I guess I should do that over there. I think that's what social media is all about, right? We literally follow people on social media. <laughs> the question is, are they following the good shepherd? Or are they following somebody else? You know how it is. Everybody's ticked off on social media. You're like, oh, I should be ticked off too. Well, you're like, no. Just because other people are upset, just because other people are saying these things, just because everybody else is doing this, doesn't mean we do it. But we're, she we're sheep. We're like herd animals. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. Follow me. Don't just go with the crowd. Follow me. The second thing I learned about sheep is that they can be stolen from a shepherd. So back in Jesus' time in the first century, shepherds would build a, a sheep pen or a sheep fold, and they put fences up, and they put the sheep in there. But then sometimes in the middle of the night, somebody might come and just pick up a sheep and take a sheep and then train that sheep to follow him. Jesus even worked this into this metaphor. He says, I'm the good shepherd, but then he said this, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a shepherd rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. And the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. So how does this relate to, to the good life? What are we talking about? We're talking about sheep and shepherds here. How does this relate to the good life? Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. Follow me. Follow my teachings. And I'm going to give you a rich and satisfying life. Don't just follow the crowd. And know that there are people that might come in and want to steal you away. Now, Jesus, in his time, he talked a lot about false shepherds or false teachers. In, in Jesus' day, these were the people that were teaching things about God that weren't true. And he was always going head-to-head -head with people like that, people who, based on their own preferences or their own traditions or their own ideas, were teaching things about God that just weren't true. They were going against what Jesus was teaching. So Jesus is like, no, that's not, that's not the, way, the way to live the spiritual life. And they were saying something opposite. And we have that today. We have to be careful about kind of what we're listening to. Does this, is what I'm hearing lining up with what Jesus said as a good shepherd? And this is one of the reasons why I, I love this church. So my uh, family and I, we've been at this church for about 20 years. I started attending this church. I wasn't a pastor at this church. I actually started attending this church. And one of the things I liked about it is this church has an over 100-year history of taking this book, the Bible, and taking the, the, the simple things and the complicated things and trying to say, what was the original author's intention to the original people that were reading it? And then how does that relate to us today, drawing the timeless wisdom and truth so that we can live a life in relationship with God. And we, we try our best not to, to, it's not about our personal opinions and convictions and stuff like that. It's about what did Jesus say and how do we live it out together? But false shepherds are not just false teachers. It's possible for us to be led away from the good life in other ways. Like here's some examples. Our self-destructive habits or behaviors. You know, it's those, those things you do that you go, yeah, I need, ugh, I need, to, I need to stop doing that. That's ruining my, my body. It's ruining my relationships. It's ruining my relationship with God, I think. I, I, yeah, I need to stop doing that. And we stop doing it and we go back to it again. It's that selfishness that we're drawn into here, that kind of self-indulge. It could be our attitude, that criticalness, that negativity that we have, the way we treat people, things we say. That can be a false shepherd. It can kind of 
pull us away from the good life. Jesus is like, follow me. Don't follow those cravings or compulsions. Here's another false shepherd, our unhealthy thinking and false beliefs. Some of us grew up in, in homes that we're still living in shame. We're still living in hiding. We have secrets because I can't be honest. I can't say who I really am. And we have this unhealthy thinking. We have false beliefs too. We have false beliefs about who we are, false beliefs about other people, false beliefs about God. We're living in unforgiveness and in bitterness and regret. God's like, that's a false shepherd. Don't follow that shepherd. Follow me. I want to live you into, I want to lead you into a rich and satisfying life where you can flourish. Right? I'll tell you about one of mine of these things in a moment. Uh, here's a third one: toxic relationships. Some of us are are drawn into relationships with people, and those people are pulling us away from the good life. God doesn't want us isolated or only hanging around with people that think exactly like we do and believe like we do, but some of us are in relationships where that relationship is actually keeping us away from the good life that God has for us, and we're, we're kind of stuck in that. Um, all of these things... Um, are just descriptions of something that the Bible describes in shorthand. Here's the religious shorthand for all these things. This word, sin. Sin is anything that separates us from God. Anything that separates us from who God really is or who God has made us to be or what God says is good or true, anything that pulls us away from the rich and satisfying life that Jesus has come to give us. Anything that does that. And it's not stuff just on the outside. It comes from within us. In fact, I asked a friend years ago about sin, and he said, I believe sin is an acrostic. It stands for self-inflicted nonsense. Right? <laughs> I cause it. In fact, when Jesus was talking about sin, he used another metaphor. He described it like a sickness. He said, I've come to heal those that are sick. Of course, you have to admit that you're sick. Do I have things in my life? Do I have thoughts and feelings and actions that actually are separating me from the good life that God has for me? Well, then I have sin in my life. And Jesus says, it's a sickness. I like to think of sin as like a a congenital soul disease that we're all born into the world with it. And each one of us, we, we, I believe we all have our individual flare-ups in our own unique ways. And we need to own that. We need to say, okay, I need to deal with this. I need to go to the doctor and say, here's, here's my spiritual problem. And that's, those are all false shepherds. Jesus is saying, I'm the good shepherd. Don't follow those false shepherds in your life. Follow me. And I've had a lot of false shepherds in my life. I've had toxic relationships that I've gotten into because of my desire to be liked. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll gravitate toward people that will feed that desire to be liked, and then it turns on me in the worst way. I've, uh, I've spent over 15 years in the 12-step community following the false shepherding of my addictions and compulsions. I'll tell you one, that, one false shepherd I'm dealing with right now in my life. I'll call it the false shepherd of catastrophic thinking. It's like, my world is falling apart. You know, like... A, I get into these zones where I'm thinking about stuff and my entire world is collapsing in my mind. It's kind of connected to my bigger problems with anxiety and some obsessive compulsive disorder that I'm getting some help with. Um, but I'll give you an example of what it might look like. Um, two weeks ago, uh, my family went to Kansas to drop off my son, get him settled in his dorm. My son, Ethan, is going to KU. Here's a picture of the three of us there. And yeah, so excited. I'm so proud of him. 
So my, my son has great grades. He got some scholarship money. He knows people at KU already. He already knows people in Kansas. And we were meeting with him, and he was getting connected with his new roommate and, and getting connected with some of the Christian clubs on campus. And he's just he's going to do great. But the entire time I was there, I was preoccupied with the fear that this is going to go terribly wrong. This, this is going to be horrible. And all I could do was ruminate on that negativity. At some point in my life, I learned that worry is a way to control things. If I worry about it enough, then maybe I can control the outcome. And I've been doing that for years, but as a result, I think negatively a lot of the time. I'm always thinking worst case scenario. Okay, let's plan for a zombie apocalypse. You know, like, <laughs> and it just weighs me down. That kind of thinking, it actually doesn't come from God. God's not telling me to worry about everything. I'm operating out of fear. God wants me to operate out of faith. And this is not positive thinking versus negative thinking. This is, am I following the good shepherd, Jesus, or am I following my unhealthy thinking and feelings? And like I said, I think I learned this early on. I was reading this book this week called uh, Abba's Child by Brennan Manning. The word Abba means daddy in Hebrew. And the idea is that, you know, God's our spiritual daddy and that, that we have a relationship with God and God loves us. And he has a chapter in here called The Imposter. And he says, sometimes for some of us early on in life, we experience pain. We don't know how to explain it or sort it through, but we go, gosh, I don't want to feel that again. So we make a decision. And we make kind of a commitment to someone, an imposter, a way of thinking, a way of feeling, a way of sorting with problems. And we make an agreement saying, if I follow you, then I won't experience pain anymore. And then we grow up and we realize that the imposter is not the good shepherd and that the imposter ends up robbing us of a relationship with God. And I think I'm learning that about myself. In fact, just this morning I was reading the back cover of the book and there's a question at the top that says, is an imposter robbing you of God's love? I think sometimes I have thoughts and feelings and ideas and beliefs that climb over the wall of my soul and steal away what is true what is the good life? Those are some of the false shepherds in my life. <laughs> Where are the false shepherds in your life? What are those self-destructive habits or behaviors? What's the, what are those unhealthy uh, thinking patterns? Uh, the, what false beliefs do you carry? Some of you might not even realize it's false. You're like, this is what I've always believed. Oh, wait a minute. This might not be true about God, about me, about the world. What about those toxic relationships? And Jesus is saying, I want you to follow me. I'm your good shepherd. Follow me. In fact, look at this great quote from Jesus. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. One translation says, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. What an, what an amazing thing for Jesus to say. Jesus comes and he says, my purpose is for you to have a rich and satisfying life. Right now. I sound like one of those crazy televangelists. Prosperity. Hey, you're going to make money. You're going to have the job. Like, I'm not saying that at all. This is just what Jesus said. The question is, what is he talking about? What's a rich and satisfying life look like? That's what we're going to be talking about. But for some of you, this is blowing you away. Because... Maybe you've been in this church for a while. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe this is the first time that you've ever set foot in a church or are watching a church online. And you grew up thinking, man, I remember God being so angry. Or man, I got this checklist. And I, I think they quoted Bible verses of where this checklist came from. But some of you grew up in homes where your parents' checklist and God's checklist were all mixed up together. And the idea that God wants to provide you a rich and satisfying life is just revolutionary. Some of you grew up in homes where God was just an idea. Or if God existed, God was like that cosmic clockmaker who just kind of wound up the world and then walked away. 
God wants to be involved in our lives. He's saying, look, I made you. I want to give you a rich and satisfying life that lines up with my purpose for you in this world right now. I spoke with a lady about a year ago, and she was wrestling in her life. She, she grew up, God was kind of distant, a little bit angry. She had, had, she had been kind of victimized by some religious people. And so just the whole idea of religion and everything kind of threw her off. And she said, I already know all this stuff. It's all negative and everything. Well, through a relationship with a friend, she started reading and, uh, some books and, and talked to her friend. And then her friend encouraged her to start reading the Bible. And she was like, well, I don't know where I'm, I'm going to read. But she opened up this Bible, and the first thing she read was a quote from the Old Testament. She said, I just read this quote from the Old Testament. I'm like, ooh, oh, what did you read? <laughs> I was a little nervous about it. Uh, but she said, here's what it dropped open to. Here was the quote. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And she said, I don't know who God was talking to. I don't know the context. I don't know what this is about. That's the God I want to know. If you're new with us, here's what we want you to know. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. And maybe you've gone through a really difficult season. Maybe you've been searching for the good life and it's eluding you. Or maybe it resonated. You got a lot of good stuff in life, but there's still that emptiness, that longing. That's because the God that made you, that loves you, has a bigger purpose for your life. And Jesus came not just to teach us on how to live, but he came to do much more. In fact, look at this other quote from Jesus. He says, the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Jesus taught that not only he said, this is how I want you to live, but then he said, I'm going to go die and then I'm going to rise from the dead. And here's what's happening when I'm going to die on the cross. Christians have always had this image of Jesus dying on the cross. It means a lot to us. The cross is very symbolic for us. Here's what it means. When Jesus died on the cross, what he did is he took all the power of our self-destructive habits and behaviors, our unhealthy thinking, our false beliefs, those toxic relationships, all the sin and the evil and injustice and all the bad stuff in the world, and he took it onto himself. And when he died on the cross, it was like he was extinguishing its power. And then when he rose from the dead, he's like, I've got power all, all, over all this stuff. Follow me and live a new life. And that's what we want for you. That's the beginning of the good life. And we'll talk about some other things as we go through these weeks and as you meet in life groups to talk about how to apply this, how to live it out. But you might be one of those people that's like, that's what I want. And we're so glad you're here. And after the service, we want to talk with you because we want to help you make that decision to say, you know what? I want to stop following the false shepherds and I want to follow the good shepherd. We want you to do that. And the good part is the reason that we're together is because we believe in doing this together. Jesus doesn't want you to just individually follow. He wants us to follow as a group. In fact, here's the last quote I want to share with you that Jesus said as he was describing himself as the good shepherd. He says, I have other sheep too. They're not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Here's what Jesus was saying. When Jesus was here, he was teaching to a group of Jewish people in first century Palestine. But he's saying, um, I'm going to go get other people, and they're going to be from China and Africa and India. Centuries and centuries from now, they'll be in America. <laughs> they'll be in South America. They'll end up being in a place called Russia. I've got all kinds of people. And you know what? Um, they speak a different language and they think differently and they have different culture and different traditions and, and they vote differently. And you know what? I want us all to do this together. It's not us and them. It's Jesus and all of us. And he says, I want to pull us all together and we can learn from each other and grow from each other and we can Start following Jesus so that we can live this rich and satisfying life. So here's the question I have for you. Are you ready to step into the good life? What does that look like for you? Maybe it means identifying some of those false shepherds in your life and saying, I need to turn from that. 
Maybe it means saying, gosh, you know, I've, I've never actually said yes to following Jesus. Maybe that's your decision today. Maybe you say, well, I've been following Jesus. I've been in this good life, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing it alone. I think I'm supposed to do it with other people. Or maybe you're like, you know what? I am doing this good life, but God's calling me to go out and find some other people to join me. I want to go find some other people that be willing to do this journey with me. Whatever that looks like today, I'd like us to just take a moment or two and think about how we might apply this. And for those of you that are joining our Good Life groups, you're going to be meeting in the groups, you're going to have an opportunity to talk through some of this information and, and say, what does this mean for me? But I guess to think about it, and as a way to think about it, we're going to close our service here, and I'm going to pray for us. Would you stand? And at Torrance, would you, would you stand for us? And again, if you're here with us for the first time, thank you so much for being here. If, if you have something you'd like to pray about, we're going to have some prayer team members available. If you want to know more about our life groups or our church or about what it means to follow Jesus, head out to our Next Steps area outside. We have some people there that would love to talk to you. Thanks for coming today, and I look forward to next week. We're going to be talking about how the good life allows us to experience great relationships. We're going to talk about what that means. Let me close this in prayer. God, thank you for this invitation to the good life. Jesus, you said that your purpose was that we could live a rich and satisfying life. We want to say yes to that. We don't know all that that means, but you do. Help us to look for the false shepherds in our life and identify them so we can turn our direction toward you. Help us to find the, the people around us that can encourage us and help us to live that good life that you have for us and remind us of your love and your forgiveness and your power over the things that can pull us away from you. We thank you so much for this good life you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, everybody. See you next week.